To say Turkey is at a crossroads would have been cliche a thousand years ago. This is a country that connects modern day Greece and Iran, that shares the Black Sea with Russia and a rugged border with Iraq. So sure, Turkey is at a geographic crossroads, but this is bigger than that. This is a country of 80 million people trying to bust out of the middle income trap. It once seemed a model of Mideast democracy now pushing towards the archetype of Mideast strongman. It's a country at conflict with its neighbors and at war with itself. And how did the government react? Uh, with more gas. From Gezi Park protests to the front line of the Syrian civil war, this is the crossroads Turkey. Let's go inside. On the morning of July 15, 2016, I met with Vali Nasser, a Middle East expert and former top State Department advisor. Erdogan, I think personally, and the political establishment in Turkey always worries that there's some kind of a conspiracy uh, to undo the government. And Erdogan even looked at the coup in Egypt and saw it as a, as a model for, uh, for uh, what might happen in Turkey. Hours later, the news came fast and furious from Ankara and Istanbul. The breaking news from Turkey where a military coup is underway. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan survived the coup attempt, and a night that began with soldiers blocking bridges ended with those soldiers flogged in the streets. Erdogan and his AKP party emerged stronger than ever, and any talk of Turkey at the crossroads has to start with the man at the steering wheel. Purges, journalists in jail, curfews, President Erdogan has acted increasingly authoritarian. But it wasn't always this way. When he first came to power in 2003, he stabilized a country that was teetering on the edge. Erdogan first assumed power as prime minister, just after the country was hit by a major financial crisis. In 2001, GDP contracted by 7%, inflation was over 60%, and the lira lost about half its value. When he came to power, infant mortality rate in Turkey was 36 out of 1,000 babies. That's a rate comparable to pre-war Syria. And now that number is 13, which is comparable to Spain. There are basically two pillars of support for President Erdogan's popularity. One is religious conservatives. The other is business, which has prospered under AKP governance. Let's start with the reinsertion of Islam into Turkish daily life. I took a walk through Fatih, perhaps Istanbul's most conservative neighborhood, with journalist Mehmet Akasal. Before AK Party, did this kind of conservative neighborhood exist? Of course it exists but they were more in close community. After our party, uh, they came on a stage. They say, we are here. And they no more uh, women don't stay at home anymore and men easily grow beard. It was a political party that uh, splintered from a, a party uh, that had uh, been on numerous occasions closed down by the constitutional court for adopting practices and policies that jeopardized or threatened the secular nature of the Turkish uh, Republic. But they came to power having moderated uh, some of uh, the, uh, the, the edgier parts of uh, aspects of political Islam. Rafsa Kavacia is a parliament member representing President Erdogan's AKP party. Women with headscarf like myself, they were not allowed to go to universities, to take medical service, or to serve in the Grand National Assemblies. Over these 15 years, things changed, and in 2015, I was one of the first members of parliament to be elected with the headscarf and able to serve. But it wasn't just religion. Under Erdogan, business was strong. It's really the economic good governance part that has delivered Erdogan's AKP four electoral victories so far. He lifted Turkey out of poverty, literally. Erdogan was the first mayor of Istanbul who brought electricity and water to all parts of the city. You know, he was accountable, he was seen as non-corrupt. Par parliamentary victories of his AKP party, the Islamic party, was ba basically 
uh, mainly based on the economic development of the country. That means if there is economic growth, the party was winning. At this point, Erdogan had created a model of moderate Islamic democracy. His country was growing. But then, something changed. The exact moment a country chooses a direction at the crossroads can be difficult to pinpoint. But in Turkey, many point to Gezi Park and Taksim Square protests of 2013. The protests began in objection to a government plan to turn a nearby park into a shopping mall. But soon, they spread to something bigger. I revisited the scene with Muratshan Erdin, who participated in the protests. At the beginning, uh, we were protesting, they were planning to destroy the park. We were protesting this, but in, in the second day, probably turns out to be a, some kind of like protest to government. And how did the government react? Uh, with more gas. Government forces brutally uh, take out the people from the park. So they burned their tents. They were just doing a peaceful protest. This period coincided with Europe drifting away from Turkey, making Turkey's accession to the EU far less likely. In turn, Erdogan drifted from Western ideals, increasingly cracking down on freedom of speech. This is Merve Buyuk Sarak, though you might recognize her as Miss Turkey 2006. So I'm Merve. <laughs> uh, nice to meet you. She's a model and was a contestant on Survivor. She was also arrested for tweeting a mean thing about the government. Actually, it was a poem. And I shared that poem on my Instagram account. And after all these trial things, uh, I learned that more than one million person shared the same post like me. <laughs> so you didn't even write this poem? No, somebody I didn't else? Write. Yeah, somebody else. The poem mocked President Erdogan. And actually, it was a really funny poem. <laughs> but the laughter was short-lived. One day I was sleeping and it was like 8 a.m. in the morning and my dog, my dog started barking and I just opened the door and there was two policemen and they say, no, we came just for you. And I was like, what? <laughs> what, have I, what have I done? And he said, uh, you shared a poem against Tai Erdogan, so we have to take you to the police station. Merve received a six-month prison sentence that was suspended, provided she does not tweet mean things about the president. Now, with all due respect for beauty queens, when your government won't tolerate a retweet from a model, this is bad, and it can have deep implications for political expression. I spoke with Professor Mezut Yegin, a public intellectual that does not always see eye to eye with the government. What I feel is that things are going to be more and more difficult for people like us, you know. Uh, tens of academics, uh, professors have already been fired. We are used to live in a kind of relatively democratic society and now I'm not ready to sort of, you know, to live in a kind of anti-democratic, you know, society within which I cannot express my feelings. So I will try to express till, I don't know, I'm stopped. These trends have exacerbated since the failed coup attempt. Extensive purges have extended beyond the military, beyond the public sector, and into the private sector and academia. Heavy-handed nationalism is palpable throughout the country. Since the failed coup attempt, there's been much more signs of nationalism in the street. For example, this sign above me says, we are the nation. Turkey will not be ruled by coup or terror. In terms of political opposition, nobody really knows the rules of the game. I spoke with parliament member Ozturk Yilmaz, vice chairman of the opposition CHP party. It is extremely difficult uh, to, uh, to play the uh, opposition role uh, in Turkey at the moment because uh, there are government uh, executive degrees bypassing parliament and parliament's role almost uh, has gone. We, we, there is a parliament but there is no functionality of it. 
uh, and there is judiciary, there is no functionality office. And uh, there is no separation of power, but monopolization of power. Uh, this is not a, not a democracy. There is a one-man system uh, and one-man rule. I questioned AKP parliament member Kavachia about these allegations. The rule of law in Turkey is intact. Uh, and the judiciary is the one who acts upon the information they receive from the intelligence services. She rejects the international backlash against Turkey following the purges. After the coup attempt, it was so disappointing to hear the concern for the people who were per perpetrators of this coup attempt. You know, the people who took their guns, turned it against innocent civilians, people who crushed them with tanks, the people who bombed us when we were in the parliament. It was disappointing to see that they were only concerned for them. Garo Pehlan is a member of parliament for HDP, another major Turkish party and one popular with beleaguered Southeast Kurds. He sees things differently than Dr. Kavacia. So the West has a blind eye on the human rights violations in Turkey. And now we have ISIS in our hands, and Turkey is not a stable country, Syria is not stable, Iraq is not stable. So let's go back to dictators. And he, they are ready to play with Assad. They have no, no, uh, uh, they, they are playing with Sisi in Egypt, and they want to play with Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the dictator in Turkey. Days after my interview with Garo, a series of HDP parliament members were arrested in what appears to be a continuation of Turkey's crackdowns. <laughs>